I mean, I'd be really hesitant to make a lot of claims around like what sort of political work poetry can do or how it can change things because it, it doesn't. But yet, I mean, I, I, more than thinking about like poetry as something that goes out and influences people politically, I almost think of it like that politics are constantly shaping literary practices in these kind of interesting ways. I mean, as I've been working some um, with friends, I've been writing some with um, Joshua Clover and Jasper Burns, and we keep coming back to this. Um, we keep talking about poetry as as the equivalent of the of the riot dog. Um, you know how the the Greece the Greek riot dog that would go to the riots and bark at the police. That that's kind of like the the thing that poetry might be able to do is that, like it might be able to accompany you into the streets, but it it will not um, it does not reshape you know oppressive structures. Finally, um, it, and it may be more shaped by. Um, by that, so that the, the what happens in the street kind of enters into the poem rather than the poem entering into the street. Finally, one of my favorite examples of um, this this overlap between politics and poetry, or this this kind of ever tenuous, um, ever changing, hard to figure out overlap, is when um, um, is is this, there's a there's a great poem by Claude McKay, who's a Jamaican poet who comes over to the United States and. Um, Writes as, writes as a writer during the Harlem Renaissance. So like many of the Harlem Renaissance poets, he's writing these really very elaborate and very beautiful and very political sonnets. And he has this, that sonnet called If We Must Die, um, I'm trying to remember it, If We Must Die, um, you know, let us not, you know, it's, it's something about, about rising up. Let, let's rise up and meet the common foe. Um, and, um, you know, he wrote it in response to various riots that were happening. And the thing that's, it's, it's this interesting poem where um, the prisoners of Attica, when they do their prison riot, they bring, they, this poem was very inspiring to them and they were circulating it during, in the, in the times before the riot and they write it on the walls when the riot's happening. And I think it's an interesting moment in which, um, in which poetry was like an, an accompaniment, right? Or like it was maybe perhaps something as mundane as an inspiration um, or maybe even a, a, some sort of um, complicated comfort. Dekine is the mosh pit at the Fuck You, Aloha, I Love You show. The mosh pit is thrashing about in masking tape. Everyone is connected in the thrash. Everyone taped together in the Fuck You, Aloha, I Love You. So the thrash in anger is the thrash of connection, of joining. The more thrashing, the more sticking. It is the thrash of reaching out for others in the most isolated land mice. It is Dekine. When I look at, when I think about that book, the, the Fuck You, Aloha, I Love You book, um, it feels to me like very much a book that um, was written in the 90s in part because it's using pidgin and it's also using Hawaiian at moments. And so the, 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 the way that I, I was trying to think a lot about language, uh, coming out of the language poets, which were thinking a lot about, about the English language, and I was trying to think about it in dialogue with these other languages that were, were kind of hap were part of Hawaii. And Hawaii had this, these, um, in addition to having a kind of like a lyric tradition that like came over from the United States, it also had um, a literature written in Hawaiian and it had a literature written in pidgin, um, which is the language that develops around contact in Hawaii. So it's a language that's a mixture of like Hawaiian and Korean and Japanese um, that a lot of p local people spoke um, uh, kind of as part of their daily language practice. And so I was trying to kind of think about what my relationship to those would be as someone who wasn't from Hawaii or who had moved to Hawaii. Um, so like a lot of the, um, the, so something about thinking about trying to um, both think with those languages but not claim them as my own language would be maybe how to put it. Um, to think about it as, um, as in dialogue with and as indebted to without claiming a fluency or some of the moves that happen in that book. Um, which is, there, there's a lot of like attention to this, this in Hawaii and like there would constantly be these complaints about um, people writing 747 poems, which would be like the people that would fly over on the airplane and they would write the poem about the beautiful beaches or they would write the poem about the beautiful birds and then they would go home and they would publish them in the New Yorker. Like there's a whole series of like, like kind of like nature poems about Hawaii that you would just see and like that were very much disdained um, in Hawaii or talked about with like mo mockingly. And um, so I was trying to think about like what, what would it mean to begin to try to, to try to, I mean, to, to not, like it felt like it, when I was in Hawaii, like I had this choice about 
um, many people would not write about Hawaii or to write about Hawaii. And I and what did it mean? Like once you decided, like, well, I am gonna I'm gonna write about Hawaii because I'm here, but um, but I don't want to be writing the 747 poem. Like what 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 would be some of the moves that I would have to make to not write that poem? And I think that that book's an attempt to do that. Finally, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether it's entirely successful or it's a lot about the decisions that I made as I tried to do that. Well, I mean, Hawaii is interesting, again, because it, it has one of the, it's one of those places like where there's a huge amount of species death, but it's also the place where they're like, you look outside and it's very beautiful, but almost everything that's there has come from somewhere else. But it has this very specific history because it's so recent, so it's kind of fast. There'll be these, like when you read things about plants in Hawaii, it'll often have like, you know, so and so brought this over on the ship from Mexico and gave it to you know Mrs. Punahou who planted it on the fence, um, and now it's taken over the entire island and it's everywhere. So like, there's this this very recent history that I was that I was really interested in, in part because this 747 poem would often be you know writing about the beautiful Bougainvillea, which is incredibly invasive, but also had this very specific story about when it arrived, like who brought the original Bougainvillea over that so altered the ecosystem. And so I was kind of interested in that as like what, um, like as part of that colonial tradition finally, or like the ways that the colonial tradition shows up. And I started taking ethnobotany classes. Hawaii has a really interesting ethnobotany department. And um, which again, like made everything even more, like I became like, like there's this really interesting category of plants that are the canoe plants, which are the plants that were brought over um, by the people that become the Hawaiians. Um, and, their, and canoes and the, that were not in the island of Hawaii that were that are so like they're also a special category of thing and, I, and in one of those poems in Fuck You Aloha I, I Love You I end up using the list of the canoe plants um, which just kind of interested me because they were a moment of a kind of altered ecosystem but one that didn't um, that wasn't necessarily destructive and invasive um, or that was cultivated to be kept in check in some way which I'm just I was kind of interested in that moment. But so as I, was, as I was working on just trying to think through that kind of stuff, I became more and more interested in like the special relationship that poetry has to, um, to nature, which is like there's, there's nature poetry, but it's also really important in um, like indigenous traditions, like a lot of chants are um, lists of um, useful plants and animals. Um, the, you know, and where they where they're located, and and so like the way that poetry can sometimes catalog information was really was really interesting to me, and I was just trying to th kind of think with that tradition, like how, what do you, what do you, what do you do with that tradition in this time of um, kind of um, altered and um, um, kind of at risk ecosystems? That was a kind of interesting question to me. Um, if poetry has this long tradition of um, being a place where cultures talk about the nature um, or plants and animals um, and their interactions with humans, um, how would we talk about that in a time in which um, the interactions between plants and animals and humans are especially fraught? March 16th, 2003. In the last few days, I have watched minas gathering materials for their nests. Yesterday, I saw one pick up and carry off a big clump of dried grass. And then I saw another struggling with a big piece of napkin at the side of the road. Such optimism, beloved, such optimism. We went to the beach yesterday, but not in optimism, but in avoidance and spoke about the birds around us and their constant singing of small songs, some of them ugly to us and some of them beautiful. We were just talking because we could, because we could spend this time together in the sun and we knew that there was something that mattered. But as we spoke of bird song, we also spoke of Bush's summit Sunday with the leaders of Britain, Spain, Portugal, and the Azores, and the prediction that there was a less than 1% chance of avoiding war. With this connection of everyone with lungs, I entered it, I, I wrote it as an attempt to think about lyric. And I was trying to think about lyric because again, like I came out of this experimental tradition and lyric was often presented as uh, the bad, the bad tradition the tradition that was bourgeois and individualistic and, um, and then nationalist. And I wanted to try and think about, I, I became interested in like, what are, what, what is the, um, what's the invocation of, of the lyric tradition, this, this call to the beloved? And um, became interesting to me as like, what are the ways in which, um, um, in a, what, are the, what are the moments in which you need to call to beloveds finally? Um, which it seems like in these moments in which um, the, uh, um, 
you know, it was right, it was right after 9-11, and um, there was a lot of sense that, that there was a national beloved, but that there was an, and, and there was an, a non-beloved that was another nation's. And so I, I was kind of interested in, like, could, could there be a way to think about lyric in that context, or could it, could, could it do some work? There are other sorts of beauty on this globe, but this sort of beauty is fully realized here. This sorts of beauty cannot get any more beautiful, any more detailed, any more rich or perfect. But the beach on which we reclined is occupied by the US military, so every word we said was shaped by other words, every moment of beauty occupied. We watched the planes fly overhead from the nearby air base as we spoke of birds and their bowers and their habits of nest. And we were also speaking of rolling start and shock and awe and 225,000 American forces and another 90,000 on the way and 25,000 British forces and 1,000 Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps combat and support aircraft in the area. Um, and then part of it, so part of it was an attempt to kind of begin to think about um, the long tradition of the political lyric, which existed outside of the United States and not much, I mean, somewhat in the United States. I mean, with that Claude McKay poem, it, it's part of it, but, um, but was not so much in the United States, at least in the, in the 80s and 90s, that, that the, the lyric tradition was the tradition that was kind of like the place where you would talk about yourself or you would talk about um, what it meant to be a first world citizen and the, and the emotions that first world citizens tend to have and, um, and, and, and the despair and you know, suburban landscapes. Um, and so I, th th I started this project where I was gonna write a poem um, a day, but I didn't really keep to the poem a day um, thing because I realized that we were gonna go to war with, um, with Iraq and I was like, I'm gonna write a poem until we go to, to war with Iraq. Like it was so inevitable. And I was like, well, maybe I could try to think about, does poetry help you understand anything? Like, could I begin to understand this thing that was slightly hard to understand? Um, and so, so I, I started the poem, I can't remember the exact date that I started it in there, but it's, um, and then finished it um, the moment um, where the United States is, is kind of marching towards Baghdad is when I quit. But I don't really know that I got a great understanding from it, <laughs> finally. The first poem in that book, um, which is the poem written after 9-11, um, I, I, I mean, I was interested in the time. I, I had at the time, I was taking um, a class, I was getting trained in hypnosis, which I had just done kind of on a lark, like I had taken a leave from my job and I was like, I'm just gonna learn something new. And so I was taking a hypnosis class, which um, was, was really interesting because, I mean, it's that moment where you realize that what people use when they do hypnosis is basically um, metaphor and simile all the time and language patterns, which is also poetry. And so I wanted to kind of, I wanted to, I was, and I was also kind of interested because it's a moment where language is supposed to change your mind, right? And um, so I built that basically as a kind of the structure of a, of, of, of a, of a trans induction and, and was kind of using um, just like, I mean, it's a series of very obvious and kind of classic hypnotic metaphors about like noticing reverse space between your hands is kind of like very old hypnotic technique and, um, and also that kind of like the moving out and moving in, the kind of zooming in and out is another thing that you often do to kind of induce trance. But I kind of wanted to induce a trance. I mean, it was a, it was in New, I was in New York at the time and it was just again like, um, there was a lot of um, um, people, I felt like, like what, are the, what are the things that a, a place that feels very besieged, um, what does it need to think about in that moment? Um, which felt like at the most cliched level, just kind of like, larger connections um, outside of the nation state, finally. Um, that I was, that, so it's, it's, the poem's somewhat a joke, like an attempt to induce a trance state um, that helps you to stop being a nationalist. But the thing that I keep coming back to that I don't, but I don't know that I have the answer to it is that, um, I mean, it's a variation of, of like what, what is the role, what, what, is, what is the role of, of language or of literature in, um, in, in, in kind of affirming and upholding the state at moments? And I, I don't actually, I mean, I think that's, that's the moment that I don't know the answer to. And that's the moment that often an experimental practice will claim to be disrupting. And I, but I, can, I, can, I can't really, I, I'm slightly hesitant around those claims. Um, but I mean, I'm interested in the moment, I'm interested in the way that, that, that I'm interested in the literature that attempts to wrestle with that. 
um, even though it might always be failing at it or that there's something about that process that constantly gets recuperated by the state all the time, right? 